thanks everybody for joining us for our latest uh, standards call. Um, the focus for today is going to be um, a catch up on some of the discussions we've been having around the booking API specification. Um, before we jump into that, should we just do a quick round of introductions? Um, um, if that's all right, just because I think we've got uh, a, a slightly different mix of people on the call today, so it'd be useful just to do some uh, kind of quick introductions. Um, Dan, do you want to go first? Uh, sorry, you're muted. Ah, sorry, everyone. Um, it was double muted, uh, one being a physical uh, button. Um, so I'm a developer at Torchbox. Uh, we work with the Football Foundation and Mike Rigby, who's uh, also in this call, um, on, on Upshot. And we are interested uh, in the booking API from, a, from an event organizer point of view. Okay, thank you, uh, Ross. Ross, you might be on mute. Hi. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Ros Woodhead from Excel Leisure. I'm the head of development there. Um, this is the first meeting that I've been able to attend. So I'm looking forward to it. Okay, great. Thanks for coming. Uh, Paul? Hi, I'm Paul Morgan from Canada River Trust, and I'm just taking an overall interest in this booking and the Open Active project in general. Great, thank you. Uh, Jamie? Hi, Jamie from My Local Pitch. Um, we're predominantly interested in consuming the facility data uh, and uh, allowing our users to uh, book it online. Thank you. Uh, Kent? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Kent. I'm from um, Go Sweat. We're an online marketplace for sports and activities, so we're looking to consume the API and present it on our website and our bookings. Great. And uh, Jade, I can see sitting next to Tara. Yeah, um, Jade from EMD UK. Um, I'm head of this section. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Tom? Uh, Tom Bean from Innovatize, uh, product manager at Innovatize, um, mobile app for making uh, bookings for leisure. Great, thank you. Uh, Mike? Yeah, and uh, it's Mike Rigby from the Football Foundation. So kind of interested on this from a few levels, kind of working closely with Sport England on this as a sort of a project, but also from a facility point of view in terms of how users can book onto our sites. But as Dan, Dan was saying, also some of our applications, so such as Upshot, which is an online monitoring tool, and also a pitch finder out, sort of future use of the API as well. Great, thank you. And Javier? Hi, I'm uh, Sobe Developer working at my local pitch. Thank you. And then we've got a few people from the Open Active team that today have left to last. Um, uh, Tara, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tara. I'm the Open Active Engagement Consultant. Uh, this is my first WPP call as well. And I used to work with Mike at the Foundation on Upshot as well. Great, welcome. And uh, Melanie? Hi there, I'm Melanie. I'm project manager on the Open Active program. Thank you. And Nick? Hello, sorry, you can't see me. i um, tried to get my uh, camera working, it's not It's not going. Oh, hello. Yeah, there we go. Hi, uh, I'm Nick, uh, and uh, a technical engagement on the Open Active program. Thank you, and I'm Lee Holmes, so I'm coordinating the standards work on Open Active. So, yeah, thanks again for uh, joining today. I will. Um, share my screen so you can see the slides um okay hopefully you can see the slides now um so we've got a couple of things that we want to focus on for the the call today uh the main one being um uh, as i mentioned an update to um the proposed flow within the booking api 
Um, and then if we get a bit of time at the end, a bit of discussion around um, uh, how we might handle um, provider initiative cancellations and some discussion around um, webhooks as a mechanism for doing that. Um, so I'm going to, um, Nick is going to kind of walk through um, the kind of revised proposal and what we've been discussing, but just to briefly recap uh, for those of you who haven't been on the, the call uh, before, um, we've been working on um, uh, a number of iterations of the booking API specification over the last few months um, and I've been getting uh, pretty close to a final version. Um, but in the most recent round of feedback, there were a number of issues highlighted um, around the, the API flow, um, the number of uh, interactions required with the API in order to make a booking. Um, and we've had, been having a quite a detailed discussion within the community on that over the last few weeks. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I circulated a document which summarized the, the feedback that we'd got from everybody. Um, and since then, um, Nick um, has been leading a, a piece of work to um, digest that and come up with a uh, proposed alternative flow, um, which we can then, assuming everyone is happy with it, um, incorporate into the API. Um, so that's going to be the kind of the focus of the discussion for today. Um, so Nick, do you want to uh, pick up from here? We lost Nick. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. We got there in the end. Um, Mac OS X has decided to update itself. Uh, <laughs> that has broken everything that I know. Uh, but that's okay because Tara's laptop is not yet updated, so we're good. Um, so, uh, yeah, hi everybody. Um, apologies for the uh, slight delay in the call, but um, I think we've still got time to go through and, um, and cover this content. So, what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you guys, is just quickly recap for those of you that weren't in the last call on this subject, what we're discussing here, um, and then get to the nub of the issue quite quickly, um, and then open the floor to discussion so that we can see if we're happy with the proposal, if there's any changes that anyone would like, or if we want to change it a completely different route. Um, all of those are available. This is just a proposal after all. Um, so jumping into the content then, um, the main question here is around uh, leasing or booking. So when you're going through a booking flow, if you imagine Amazon.com, you pick the thing, you put it in your basket, you go to the checkout page, you put your personal details in, you put your payment details in, and then you confirm the booking. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in Amazon.com, if there's only one book left, someone else can steal that from your basket at any point during that flow. So it's only at the very end of the booking that you actually have that thing confirmed and that you, it's reserved for you. So that's one end of the spectrum. And Ticketmaster is the other end of the spectrum. So if you've ever used Ticketmaster to book, uh, for example, a theatre ticket, you'll notice that in the top right-hand corner, there's a little timer that comes up that you can see here. And when you go on and select your row E, seat 31 and 32, that's timer starts. And when that happens, they don't even know who you are at this point. That spot is reserved for you. So no one else can take that spot until you finish the flow. When you finish filling in your personal details, the next page is the payment details, and you get an extra eight minutes to do that. So they give you five minutes to do the personal details and eight minutes to do the payment details. Um, so obviously there's the different approaches there. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, so that's the first bit of context. We'll come back to that. Um, does that, does that kind of make sense? Okay, nodding, great. Um, okay, second bit of context from the previous call is that there's two ways of doing booking. Um, if you if you've got a booking system, you might already be aware of this in respect to payment. Um, so there's this two phase commit thing. So in order to make sure that both the booking and the payment happen, and that neither happens without the other, which would be bad, you need them both to go through. Um, you have to do what's called a two phase commit, which means you have to say I'm reserving one, and then do the other, and then confirm the first. So on the left hand side, you've got uh, two step booking where you first reserve the order, so that thing in your basket. You then capture the payment and confirm the payment, and then you book the order to confirm the thing in the basket. 
on the second option B there on the right hand side is the other way around. So you take a, effectively a lease on the payment, you confirm the booking, and then you go back and confirm the payment afterwards. So you see what I mean? It's just like interlocking, but the opposite way around. Makes sense? Yeah. Great. Okay, so the next slide then. Testing again. <laughs> <laughs> um, is uh, it's a summary of the previous discussion that we had um, some input from a number of organizations. And I'm not sure if, um, I don't think Netpulse was on the call today. However, um, one of our key bits of feedback was that there was uh, a lot of complexity in the previous version of the spec um, in terms of the number of calls needed to be made. Another bit of feedback that we've received from smaller booking systems is that it requires, um, the current version of the spec requires you to implement more than uh, they necessarily support, so leasing. Um, uh, and so ideally, we would have a spec which was very simple for a simple system, but could support more complicated scenarios for more complicated systems. Um, and uh, so if you go to the next slide after that, slide after that, right. So just bringing this down to the flow then, and really what the, the kind of nub of the issue is here initially. Um, this is the journey uh, that a user can go on, and it's annotated on the left and right hand side. So just going through the journey before I talk about what's on the left and, and the right, um, or sorry, the left and right of the side there. If you look at the select, register, book and pay, it's generally the flow that you go through on any kind of site or portal. You select the thing you want, you register, you put your information in or log in, and then you pay for the thing at the end. Those three steps. Maybe not all necessary. If you're using Apple Pay and you're using your thumb, you might skip straight to the end. You select and then book and pay and register happens with your thumbprint. Um, but those three things tend to happen. Um, and obviously the question is, at what point in that process do we allow people to reserve the place? So can someone steal it from your basket when it's been selected? or while you're entering your registration details or when you're putting your payment details in. And so this kind of um, illustration in the middle shows that there's kind of, there's two checkpoints before you get to the end of this journey really. There's the, the checkpoint at the beginning where you say, I'm interested in this particular squash court. Um, then there's the checkpoint halfway through where you say, I'm interested in this squash court and actually this is my full name, surname and email address because I've logged in. And then there's the finish of actually, here's my payment details, I want to book it, and it's done. Um, and so that's the journey, and th this proposal then talks about how we can make it so that it's possible to have someone go through the journey and have it not reserved at all until the end, and it's also possible that you can have it reserved at the very beginning, at the first checkpoint. Um, so does that, does that kind of make sense as, as context? Um, so before I, before I talk about technically how, um, I know we had some of this on the last call, but just for, for those that are, are new maybe, does anyone here have any preference as to whether you think you would like to allow reservations from the beginning of this process, so someone can't have anything stolen from the basket at all, or whether you'd rather things be stolen until the last minute, uh, a bit like Amazon, and uh, only when it's paid is it confirmed? Shall I chip in here just because of Ian's not here from Legend? So we had a meeting with some Legend customers yesterday and the general consensus amongst them was let them reserve it from the very start. And in terms of sort of the volume of people coming in to book these sessions, that behavior seemed to be the most appropriate and also sort of maximum user satisfaction using these booking sites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we at XN Leisure would agree with that. We, we don't want people to be able to steal bookings halfway through the process. I, I think from, um, from the implement perspective, we'd want to focus on the user journey being good, um, i.e. not having the space stolen. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Ian, who's apparently not here, which is good news for me. Um, yes, we did very definitely get feedback yesterday to say that uh, users in general wanted to have the lease applied as early as possible. Um, I think that's something that we would probably um, need to implement in the stage two. 
um, because we're not the system itself doesn't support anonymous leases. So we're going to have to do a bit of internal work to manage that. So our first version of this, um, it would only be checkpoint two that would actually provide the lease. But obviously, because of the way this is structured, we'll be able to go back and uh, retrofit that without any any changes to the specification. Great. Does anyone? Um, so it sounds like we've got um, some. Everyone so far has said checkpoint one is the ideal, but checkpoint two for some is is where they can get to initially. Um, does anyone think just? And it's totally okay, obviously, because it's different people with different systems. That they that they don't want to do any leasing at all, uh, ideally, as and just just uh, have as a preference. I mean, rather than as, as what's possible within the system, as a preference, would you rather have a kind of steel scenario? And maximise the number of bookings because, of course, if things can't get stolen, there's more people can just book stuff. Um, but with a worse user experience, I think from a, a marketplace perspective, uh, the focus will always be on the user experience. So, where possible, if we can have the lease, uh, that would be the preferred method. Any 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 counters to that, or are we going to say mo the motion is we would prefer C1 across the board if possible? Okay, sounds like that's. First, the question is there, um, uh, is it part of the standard uh, to have like a standard or average lease time? No. Countdown. So, that's a good point. So, we haven't, that's not something that is in there at the moment. We could recommend uh, um, a time for another system. I guess it's um, if it was like a aggregated booking of bookings, then some people might only want to lease out. For a certain period of time, and I don't know if that changes from system to system. They get to set what their lease period is, but then if you're aggregating it, how does that work? If one one booking next to another one booking's got a lease of fifteen minutes, and the next one's got a lease of five, I don't know how that works. Yes, that's true. So I think so. I think because uh, the cost of servicing the lease is on the, the provider side, um, the it, it's on the provider where they should have. Be able to define what the lease period is rather than it being something that's negotiated um, so i think what we have in the api currently is that if a lease uh, well yeah yeah where a lease has been generated that the time remaining on that lease is is available somewhere um, which would mean that you can then do implement a countdown on the client and in the case where you have multiple things you could and there needs to be separate countdowns you could still do that to give the user some feedback. So I think that, that would be the, the simpler option because it, um, like I said, it manages where the cost is. If it has a billing associated. Uh, Lee, could we have, um, so I don't know if it should be in a standard or not, but if someone uh, is very slow and or an app keeps refreshing the lease forever, uh, could the provider have the ability to um, just tell them no? So there's, you know, I can, uh, my lease is for 10 minutes, but the overall lease period is like 30 minutes. And if you head past that, then we're in a position to say lease abandoned, even though it's only been four minutes since the last attempt. Did that make sense? That's You're looking blank at me. That's certainly what, uh, what, what um, Ticketmaster seems to do. Uh, sorry, Lee, you want to ask me? Yeah, I was, I was going to say it's, it seems reasonable to, to, to do that. I was just trying to think through about <clears throat> how we might, might do that in the specification. Um, you know whether we would kind of mandate that as an as a mechanism, or whether we would just indicate that that's a, an option that providers have, and maybe just define what that error code or error status would look like when the lease has been denied. So, so the I'd be happy with that as an option. Okay. So the proposal at, at the moment, as it as it stands, does include a little bit about this, which is um, that. So, so 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 I guess take us through the flow then. Um, in terms of checkpoint one, checkpoint two, and, and booking, the idea here is that um, that the broker, which is the app that's making the booking, uh, external app, third party, other names, um, will whenever they, whatever point they're at, will call in with this checkpoint to confirm the price for the user, uh, and to and at every point during that checkout journey, um, where they can. And so, for example. Uh, to take a situation where C1 and C2 are implemented um, because in this um, proposal they're optional because of the cost of implementing them in some systems and people's varying degrees of support. 
um, but we all agree that they would ideally be there. Um, if you, as a broker, the way that you work with this spec is that you, you assume that C1 and C2 are implemented because you won't know otherwise and because the, the, the difference in whether they, they lease or not is a thing that's happening in the background. Um, so basically what, what happens is that you, you load up the, the basket um, maybe before the user is even registered and you check in with C1 to say, great, I'm keen to, uh, this, is, this is a user, they want to book this thing. It returns the price and any VAT or basket details, whatever is included in that, and you display that to the user. As soon as that you, you then register that user, you then check in with C2 and say the same thing, um, but now here's my user details. And then when you want to do the booking, you do the same call effectively again, but this time you include the payment details that you, you've taken. Um, and the idea is that each time with C1 and C2, if you check in, uh, then when you check in, it actually gives you a lease expiry date and time. So you can check in with C1 and it will tell you you've got five minutes. Now, it's a good question about whether we allow someone to check in again and extend it. And I think what you're saying there is that um, actually, yes, maybe that's the thing that, that we will let people do, but then there's a, to a point to a maximum. Um, but within the scope of what's specified here, there's no reason why you couldn't have a, a C1 check-in repeatedly until the point where you don't get a lease anymore. And even then, you could continue to check in with C1 to um, if, if the basket changes or if you wanted to check, a, check the price again after a certain period of time or whatever that was, because there's no cost to that call. Um, it should be fairly quick and there's no transaction behind it if there's no lease. Um, then then the broker could continue to check in like that if they just wouldn't get any lease. And the way this works is that there's no assumption through C1, C2 and the booking step that a lease has actually been given at all. So you can continue all the way through without a lease being given and then still the booking succeeds um, if the things are available at the end. Of course, if a lease has been given, then the lease will be used at the last step if that makes sense. Um, so, so yeah, so it's basically um, checkpoint one, you provide the details of the, oh, sorry, you, you provide details of the basket only. Checkpoint two, you provide details of the basket and the user. And checkpoint three, you provide the details of the basket, the user and the payment. Um, and each time you do this, you, in this proposal, you use uh, what's called a, uh, universally unique identifier, which is a, a random um, string of digits that you create uh, when the user enters your checkout process. And you use that same UUID, that same unique string for checkout one, checkout two, checkpoint one, checkpoint two, and, and booking piece. Um, which means that if you, um, if you provide that information to checkpoint one, then that string can be used to lease against and then that lease can be refreshed or added to in checkpoint two. Um, and then that same string is available in the booking part to then use that lease. Uh, or indeed, if the booking system doesn't support any of this because it's too expensive to implement or they're not at that stage yet, then that's, that string can be completely ignored and no lease provided. And then what happens is when you get to book is that if there's availability, then the booking goes through. Um, so that should that should kind of partly answer. Sorry, I don't realize I jumped, just jumped in on top of what you were saying there, but um, that should partly answer that. But also, as that explains the general process, um, does that work? Do you think? Um, has anyone got any questions or queries on that? Uh, maybe if I can just add something, um, that I think it's probably important to highlight is this approach with the broker basically defining a unique ID that is maintained through this process means that the provider, so on the server side, there is no state maintained at all, unless uh, there is a lease. In, in which case, if there is a lease, then you only need the state required to maintain that lease, the minimum bit being the, uh, the UUID, unique ID that the broker has given you. Could I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, it's Ian here from, from Legend. Um, I, I read the um, document yesterday, and I think what it's saying is that you've effectively got a, a full order. So what you're doing is you're sending an order backwards and forwards. It's not committed, it's not confirmed, therefore an older quote. So you're going to send in, this is the order I may want in the future, 
and the UUID is effectively the order number. Um, at first, I thought it was for the individual uh, request, but I think not. I think it's actually for the whole order. Thank you, Lee, for your nodding. It's helping me a great deal. Um, so what you're doing is you're saying, this is what I'd like to buy. And there might be one, two, three, four, five, and then you add a sixth one. And then we have to say, yes, uh, you can buy that. These are all the prices. Uh, if we happen to know who the order's for, then we may want to amend the prices, depending on memberships. That's a future thing, but in potential, we can do that. And then we send the whole order back with additional information on leasing and other things. And finally, we just at the very end say, uh, presumably we'll include the UID. So this is the order quote which we prepared earlier. Um, there may be changes in it because you may be going to do that as a first step in B, or it may be something you've gone through four or five stages first, and then that final thing is the is kind of the commitment. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that's it exactly. Um, and that addresses some of the uh, some of the issues that are highlighted before. That if there is a failure at B, so say the broker sends a, that booking request and for whatever reason doesn't get a response, um, you're in an indeterminate state. Um, if it retries with the UID, um, if that order has already been successfully placed, but somehow the response got lost, then the provider can uh, indicate an error or just provide. Uh, a link to the successful order. Um, if it hasn't been placed because it hasn't been logged, then it's safe to reply it. So it uh, becomes an item potent um, request at the end. Um, I do have a question. Um, this might be my lack of knowledge. Um, if a broker has um, is, is selling spots um, of activities and they can be different places, and so I've got in my basket one class that's come from one booking system and another class that's come from another booking system and they've both got different lease times. How would, how would that work? Go on, Nick, you go ahead. So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a bit at the bottom of the proposal where um, <laughs> I quite disparagingly said that that would be an unusual use case. However, I think that's probably, that's probably a good thing to, to cover. So. Sorry, no, I'm no. going to get checked out. <laughs> no, 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 that's good because I, I, I specifically referenced Spogo because I know Spogo spent a great deal of time trying to make that work and it's quite expensive. However, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the proposal, it does mention that um, the way to do that is you would need a lease in order to guarantee complete the complete basket of success or failure because if you don't have a lease, then if one of those bookings goes through, you can't then undo it you'll end up with half the basket completed. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have everybody in that transaction, uh, every booking system, implementing at least C2. Um, and you'll know that because as you're adding things to the basket, you're getting the lease expiry times for each one. So you'll know the total, how long you've got until at least the first item in the basket has expired. Um, it might be worth to make that a bit easier, putting not just the lease expiry, but the total potential lease extension in there too. Um, because there's a difference between it will expire in a minute and actually, as Ian said earlier, it will expire in a minute and it won't be able to be renewed. So you have, that will give you the minimum time for the basket. Um, and then assuming that you have all of that, um, all of those leases in place, then you can go ahead and take the payment and then go and book them all. That's fine. And so if one doesn't have a lease, then it just won't work? Well, if, if one doesn't have a lease, the, ch the challenge will be that that might the booking for that one might go through and the others might fail and there's no way of making sure that they all go through together mm -hmm. so you could i mean within the user interface because this will be a problem where for example some of the smaller booking systems um, don't have leases yet um, um, they may well, well do in time it might well be that in the user interface we display something to the effect of you know this is a grouping of items which will be booked as one transaction and there's another grouping that we booked as a separate transaction and maybe even separate subtotals so that you can imagine if one fails then the user expects that to be the case and you don't want to be in a situation where you've booked the crash and you've booked you know the whatever class and then one goes through and the other doesn't and you have, yeah. you're a bit knackered because yeah. what do you do with the kids it's that situation so that, that i suppose you can definitely see situations where you want to make sure that both complete i think um for that reason although i think only lee said it's, it's down to the the owner of the activity and um, whether they have a lease and the time of that lease it still might be worthwhile even if it was a, a 
uh, this is what we recommend to recommend a lease time um, just so that you're working towards that lease time to have consistency if you have multiple things in the basket. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, for, the, for those people who have leasing in their system, if they either want to say now or follow up afterwards to give us some idea about what that le typical lease duration looks like, then we could we can make that as a recommendation. I think that seems reasonable. Question. Um, what, how does it work on something like booking.com or Trivago at the moment? Is that a, you can steal up to the last minute? I don't actually know. Um, I, I don't I was thinking that might be a good comparable example. So it might not be within those situations. It's probably that you're only booking for one thing at a time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. It just becomes much more complex when you're basically interacting with multiple um, providers behind the scene. You know, the default flow here, it will be either you'll, you'll get the entire order booked or not. Um, but once you've got multiple back ends, it, it's, it's really difficult to do that orchestration without adding a whole extra layer on top, um, which it's not clear we need yet. So I think, so one of the reasons why we've thought ahead about a few of these things is just to make sure that we haven't boxed ourselves into a corner. It doesn't mean that we've managed to bottom out all of the technical issues um, because you know, it, for, in for the first implementations is just trying to get everybody to implement a consistent booking API and then there's a whole bunch of other co kind of coordination and best practices to, to get in. I think um, on the part or on the point of a basket, uh, there are quite a few complications with things like payments as well. Uh, and from our perspective, we just haven't considered a basket with multiple operators yet. Um, just because of the complications you'll find elsewhere as well as, as this point on the leasing. Um, and so it's not a huge priority to allow for that. I mean, and there's, there's no requirement. Yeah. So, so we're, we're kind of trying to acknowledge that, that that's a potential future requirement and test the design against it but it's not necessarily something that we're considering in scope for this first release. And uh, it's probably worth reiterating that a, a broker wouldn't necessarily ever have to support uh, purchases against multiple backends if they felt that that was detrimental to their, you know, their user experience. They could just filter the user through a, you know, a series of transactions instead. I think from the provider perspective as well, um, even ignoring any commercial implications of mixed baskets against their competitors, which probably isn't an issue, uh, the, the overhead with managing this multi-provider basket really is very significant. Uh, you need consistency of leases, you need a rollback process, a whole load of things. Um, I, I wouldn't have thought this is even a version two opportunity. I would think it's, you know, if it's been running for five years successfully, then we might think about it. So whilst I recognize that we should make sure we're not backed into a corner, um, I don't think it's something that has a priority for probably for any of us, to be honest. Okay. Um, it might be worth, um, just in terms of the design and the, and the backing into corner stuff, it might be worth thinking about maybe having this set up work in such a way as the, that the booking system advertises whether they are C1, C2, or neither as part of the feed. To make it really available so so it's not just a case of trying it and seeing what you get back uh, as much as it is a bit more of a robust you know what you're going to get so you know what to expect uh consistency i don't know what you think about that yeah, personally i don't think the booking system ought to need to know i don't think it should change the behavior i mean the whole point about this design is so that it just works mm. um uh, i don't know what value that would be to the customer the end, end user to say uh, rush through this registration process, otherwise you might lose the um, you might lose the booking. I don't think that's something you want to advertise. So I'm not really sure I see the value of that. Yeah. Cool. A anyone else has any other thoughts? Does that make sense to them? Yeah.
So I've got a, um, there's a the next slide is a bit more um, detailed of the same thing. Probably not worth getting into too much on this call, but to kind of give you an idea of the flow, it would be this is the same, but just a different version of the diagram. You can see at the top there you've got broker, booking system, and processor. Um, um, beginning, the broker makes an order quote, the booking system may or may not have a lease attached at the point where it comes back, but as Ian says, it doesn't matter, you could just crack, you just crack on anyway. Um, broker then makes another call to the C2 when they have details. Um, and again, the same thing happens, may or may not have a lease. And then at B, um, assuming that, um, that when the user presses the commit button to pay, um, you take the total value that you know that you need to charge, which has come from either C1, C2, or is straight from the feed if you're going straight to B um, as a broker. Ideally, you would take it from C2 so you know it's the correct amount. You authorize that payment with the payment provider. You then confirm that with the booking system. So you make that payment. Um, so you, in, in the booking system, you say, this is the payment that's taken. These are the last four digits of the card, et cetera. Um, that gets confirmed. And as soon as that's confirmed by the booking system, you then catch the payment. Um, and that authorize and capture two-step process is the one that's supported by all the payment providers we've found so far. Um, and means that as a booking system, if you wanted to be, if you were a very, very small booking system, you wanted to do this as a very lightweight first implementation, you'd only need to implement that small arrow at the bottom, that blue arrow. And that's all you need is that one call. And that gives you booking that works across all the different brokers. Of course, for more advanced booking systems where you have leases, you would then implement C2 and even C1, uh, would then give you the rest of the functionality. And it sounds like over time, we want to really encourage people to do that with C2 and C1. I suppose again, to Ian's point, it might be a few years before people see the value in implementing those things. But as soon as we showed them the stats of basket abandonment and how people may be annoyed about um, missing out uh, compa or, or comparing people with leases to people without and, and success rates and things, we can probably make the case that it's a useful thing to have um, with data as well to make it more compelling to implement C1 and C2. But without mandating it at this stage, I suppose that's the key with all of this is if we don't mandate C1 and C2 now, we will hopefully get more people implementing because it's going to be cheaper and easier to do so to increase the volume of data available overall. And then over time, we can look to together improve the experience. Um, any further questions or comments on this? Yeah, I was just going to say, so um, <laughs> the on the left, the select register book and pay, um, I think there's in, pardon? Recognize that. Yeah, yeah, just a bit. Um, so that's from our single page process. So I, we've implemented something that does effectively C1, C2, and then that final B payment, that B order, sorry. So to the both order quotes and the order, but currently on our public site, we're just doing the B payment, the simple one. Um, so we authorize, then we make the order and then we capture the payment. Um, and we're actually got both running. So if some people are receiving the C1, C2, um, UI, which is slightly different. Um, that's that's our that's the UI from the other one. But um, it's been it's been interesting. So we're we're collecting data on that at the moment. It'll be interesting to see what the um, A B test on that is like. But I think at the moment, because we're really using only only our internal um, bookings for this process, so we've got our own internal um, providers on our platform. Um, we're finding that B is sufficient as long as there's more than a couple of spaces. Um, but we haven't really had the experience yet of five people trying to book at once. So that, that's when we'll find out whether or not it'll be a proper problem. But definitely C1 and C2 for us, as, as we've implemented the whole, like the variations, C1 and C2 aren't too difficult to implement actually. And it's um, like, like it was said earlier, it's a much nicer flow. It's much nicer for the user to experience. Uh, Nick, just to go back uh, to something you just said, um, just to check my understanding now. Um, you said that if you're just doing a simple thing, then you only need to do the blue arrow at, on B, right? You only need to offer, you need to, in your endpoint, you only need to have that slash order endpoint. Oh, sorry, of course, you would need to implement the other, the order quote as well, but you wouldn't need to implement the lease. You're right, I oversimplified that. Um, yeah, so everyone will have, at least, will have to offer those two and possibly others as defined by the rest of the spec, those two endpoints. Well, is just... Totally. The reason I've said uh, the, uh, right, uh, the, where that came from, although it wasn't accurate, is that, that implementing all the quote 
should just be as a, at a very basic level that's an availability check um, and that's something that they should be able to if they've already been to the feed effectively it's just getting an item from the feed that was going to be my next question. So uh, currently in the API, in the booking API, it says that um, the provider should be, you should be able to do a, a get request on the, the ID from that you've, you've got for a, an item in the feed and that the get request on that will return you current availability. So are you suggesting that, that we don't need that anymore or that that is just a, supports a separate thing to the order quote endpoint? Yes, actually, that's right. So, I was, uh, so, uh, suggest that as part of this suggesting that um, we don't need what was there as a get request anymore uh, because although that might be useful it probably forms part of the opportunity API which is part of an expansive set of, of requests that you can you can make and rather than um, having the booking API require one component of the opportunity API and have them kind of mixed. Um, actually, this allows us to completely separate the two. So this flow works entirely independently with these two endpoints. They can be separately authenticated, separately available, etc. Um, and then the uh, the, the old uh, version of there, which was um, definitely forms part of, a, of an opportunity API for sure. Um, wouldn't necessarily be. Uh, implemented by everybody who's, who's doing this, especially I, again for the simpler systems um, where the availability from the feed is going to be enough to go ahead and, and, and put the thing in the basket and book it against them. So that, um, that call. I don't know if it's a good question about whether we take that. So, so assuming that that was a thing we wanted to do and make that optional, it's a question of whether we take it out and put it in the opportunity a API, whether we keep it in and make it optional, whether we want to still recommend that. Um, so that we can have that final check um, in real time. I think that the main difference to flag is an order quote will give you a basket response. So it will give you, I want to buy these three items, the cost is this, and I can, the other thing the order quote checks is, I can book them together, because you might have a table tennis court and a badminton court in the same physical space. When you put them in the basket, you might find they don't actually, you can't do both of those things, it just looks like you can. Um, because they are the same thing in fact in the sports hall. Um, so that's what the order quote does. It checks all of that availability of the basket, the availability and the price, as well as the lease. Um, the availability uh, check, which is the thing that we had before, does something slightly different. So instead of a basket of three items and checking all those things around it, the availability check is for a single item, what are the options that I have available to me? Availability and offers. So adult, junior, senior, um, and sub events that might be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. By the time you get to the order quote here, you've picked Friday, adult, and you're getting the, the availability for that in the basket. So yes, I can, and this is how much. Um, so there's a question about whether it's still useful to have that earlier stage um, real-time information, um, which is you know, these are the wide of a, a range of available options, or whether we're happy to just rely on the feed for that. I, I'm, from my perspective, I definitely want them as separate things because, as you said, they're two separate actions. One's like asking for the menu and one's asking for a specific item, right? Um, so on, uh, as, a, as a marketplace or consumer of the data, having those two separate endpoints is useful because they're completely different use cases. Yeah, I agree. But do you think that we should be defining both of those, use case, those, both those endpoints in the first version of this specification? Yeah, ideally, yes. Yeah, I, I, I was kind of leaning the same way. I, I kind of acknowledge uh, Nick's point that there is a the kind of opportunity API, which is a separate spec that we've not really kind of dug into in great detail yet. That's where that endpoint would naturally live, but it could move to that spec later. You know, we, we issue a new release of the booking thing and it would just, it would just build on that spec instead. Um, it feels yeah. like there is some useful things there like being able to recon reconfirm not just the availability but the current offers and current pricing uh, which you might for, for a um, for a good user experience you might want to be able to check there and then when somebody is is, is looking up uh, details of an item yeah I think for, for me I guess the question is if I say I was um, say we say we were opening up our marketplace and we wanted people to be able to get the opportunity information do would we want that um, endpoint as part of the specifications for it to be 
uh, for us to fully implement it. And I think in the other spec, we wouldn't want it unless we were looking at booking. So for me, it feels more like part of the booking process and therefore, whilst it's a bit of a crossover lives here, because I think it'd be a shame to then um, have people who suddenly are, haven't implemented the entire original opportun uh, the original spec, because I think um, just because they're not going to the booking process, I think that, that's a diff two different use cases again for me. So do we think overall then this should be a, a recommended or a required the opportunity so the, the the getting the list of offers and the available um opportunities uh, available yeah offers and availability for a particular thing is that required i think i've worked out what it is man yeah. on that era it's okay. missing one of the concerns i've got with this process is i'm just a bit concerned about how heavy it's going to get because every time you submit an older quote uh, it's got a lot of items in it. It's got to then do quite a lot of work um, rather than just adding to an order. Um, I, I, so I, I, I think there's going to be some challenge with implementing this so that you don't keep going to the backing system and say, uh, retrieving the order, finding out what the current state of everything is and so on. So um, having something which is very lightweight, just says what's the current price, what's the current availability, um, that may well be a valuable um, precursor to doing more heavyweight things. Uh, my concerns are more applicable when there's multiple items in the basket, and they're certainly applicable when we, you know, if if we're getting uh, very high volumes through, which is probably not where this um, API is aimed for. If we get, if we're trying to make 10,000 bookings in a few minutes, um, and it's coming through this process, that's going to add. I think that will add a certain significant overhead to what we would normally do with just adding individual items to the basket um but that's that, i don't know if that's a niggle or if it's a real problem so it's just a concern i guess so something that I, I think tom mentioned um before um who knows in the call somewhere uh but, but yeah so the question about whether you want a few calls that take less time or one call that takes more time and i suppose in putting this like, I, was, I was definitely mindful of that comment from the last call and putting this proposal together one of the um, things in that was if because the order quote itself um, doesn't well I suppose it doesn't require a lease necessarily um, but it might in the back end just be maintaining a, um, a basket in fact as, as it otherwise would be I mean if, if it's called every time a new item's added really it's all you're doing is you're dipping against what you've got and you're adding and removing items until the basket matches what, what it's asking for and then giving it back again so I suppose in the case where people are adding things to the basket, you would probably be calling order quote each time that got added, and it would probably be a very similar call to add item. Um, it just wouldn't, um, as before, wouldn't require the state to be stored if all you were doing was getting, was just checking whether those two things are in the same court or a variant on availability rather than leasing. Uh, guys, you must forgive me, I have to dash off now. So uh, thanks so much for your time, and I'll look forward to the next meeting. Bye-bye. Okay. So I, I think guest to recap what you were just saying there, Nick, the so the, the original design, all of the state was on the server. In this proposed change, all of the state is being maintained on the client. Um, because a basket lived there, assuming that's what's being offered to the consumer. But the there is an option as an optimization step for the server side to maintain some state if that was useful because they have you have a shared key between both sides so that is a kind of step that could, that could be implemented it just wouldn't necessarily be required by the specification it could just be a note for implementers that you know it's perfectly valid to do this and that would reduce the process of overhead for some of those requests mm -hmm. so, you, so i guess i'm checking there is it so um <laughs> so it's got to just drop that and, and, and run away which is fair enough um, do, we, do we think that that's a blocking concern is what I'm trying to figure out. Is, is that something that we are worried about? Uh, or do you think, as you say, with that dip in place and with that shared state in place, effectively you're looking at the same call, the same calls and, uh, uh, and, and potential uh, latency anyway? I don't know. I don't, I don't see it as a blocker, I think. Like you said, it's, it shouldn't be too hard an operation to work out what the state change in a basket is. And if you're running leases, then you're going to have to be a stateful system anyway. And if you're not running leases, then it makes no difference. And if, if you're going to have to do the call at some point, so it, all you're doing is pushing down the line. If you're not 
if you're not wanting to make the check that you can book tennis and I don't know football or whatever it is at the same time because they share the same court if you're not doing that say at stage c1 and you're leaving it to stage b well then you've still got to make the same process and the same call you're just um pushing that work down for further down the line so you're going to end up with a very heavy b call on the server side if you don't if you don't open the, the user to do it later on and you're just going to increase the failure which is not going to be particularly pleasant for experience for anybody not the broker nor the nor the customer um, and the booking system is going to find that they don't get as many bookings so for me it's it feels like it should be something that's maintained and a check that's done throughout yeah and i guess this is this is the kind of thing that um uh, early implementations will help us test out um, so actually again to be able to try it uh, would be good um so it looks like we're, we're just about out of time um uh, I think we'll we'll defer the discussion about the kind of webhooks until next time. Um, before I wind up the call, is there, is there anybody else that wanted to uh, rate, give, chip in any comments on this discussion or raise any other issues? I won't go around everyone, but just just speak up now if there's if there's anything that's on your mind. A kind of a nod or a similar sign from uh, Paul, Tom, Roz, and Dan. Sorry to single you out, guys. Um, but uh, really interested in whether you think this is feasible from your perspectives. Uh, I'll start off uh, in my current guys, Nick. Uh, I'm not sure I've got um, it, it, it all seems manageable as other people have spoken to. Um, obviously, I've got feedback from previous guys, but um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure I can comment on that at the moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit scripted, but you. Yeah. I know what you mean, uh, and that's fine. We, we should we we should ask Gladstone for some input. You should ask Gladstone for some input. Yes. We'll, we'll do that. Uh, Roz, you're almost Gladstone. I'm sorry, that was terrible. You're not at all. <laughs> 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 uh, that's that's done call for. <laughs> do I, do I, can I quote that, Roz? <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Russ? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, I, I missed about the last 10 minutes of, of, of the call. Um, but yeah, in principle, it all sounds okay. Um, I, I think I have to have a closer look at, I've not really looked at the whole specification as yet. Um, but yeah, seems okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Dan? Um, yeah, I'm going to mirror uh, the same thing, uh, but it does seem there's a there's a heavy inclination uh, towards uh, having leases, so have, making those uh, a recommendation. Um, it, it yeah, it it sounds it will. Uh, yep, yeah, I hit that button again. Um, yeah, so I was saying it's it's a it's a useful uh, uh, thing from a, from a, a user experience point of view. Uh, the big question that probably uh, we still need to answer is whether it should be a one big call or <laughs> multiple calls, and that seems to be it's a it's a it's a big back and forth. Uh, I'm in favor of several calls, but I can see that from a volume po point of view that that not might not be uh, feasible or or lightweight. So uh, not dealing with uh, we were not dealing with outside of things uh, at the moment, so I can't comment more. Okay, that makes sense. Um, uh, and uh, finally, uh, Paul. Uh, it all makes sense to me. I um, really like the, the idea of the leases. Um, I'd be really in favour of the several little calls at times and scale, have the scale on the back end to handle those and then um, deal with the well, resource issues if you need to. But yeah, uh, it all seems good to me. And if I was going to build something like this, this would probably be the way that I would do it. Okay. So to both of you at the end there, just to check, when you say several little, little calls, you're meaning... Uh, you'd rather do C1, C2 than B rather than all the once. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be doing lots of little things just to keep updating the basket as I need to. 
just to even even maybe some things like um, keeping the client in sync in terms of the lease times and stuff like that. But that I guess you could keep you could go either way depending on what the um, the implementer wanted to do. They could actually maybe specify it one way or the other. Brilliant, that makes sense. So we're saying yes, this 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 works as a framework, and in within that, we can then the implementers can optimize according to their use case whether they they do one big call or if they're a complicated system, they might want to. Uh, make make changes to saves at different points and things prior to that. Okay, that, that, that makes sense to me. I was, I was kind of worried that we might be in a, uh, there might be a, some kind of questions or pushback in that, but I think that seems like we're happy with it, just that there's some implementation notes. Does that sound good to you, Lee? Yeah, it does, yeah. So I think the next step then is to actually uh, work on an iteration of the spec to put in, put this in uh, with the additional detail so that we can um, Pass that round for additional review and, and move forward to doing some uh, test implementations. Um, a quick, quick, quick question here. So, when you um, on the third on on C two, when you are sending the user details, do you have already in mind what I, what kind of information we, we will be sending to the? You go to the next slide, Lee. Handily, yeah. Okay. It's in the middle of the slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. That was that was the that's what um, the iPhone sorry the Apple Pay gives you as a minimum. So that's what that, that's where that has come from. They're not just four random fields. They're the exact fields that you get from Apple Pay, Google Pay, every Pay. Um, if you wanted to implement that without any further data capture. Yeah. Well, I guess that the tricky thing is that from a marketplace point of view is how do you pick the right price for a slot, uh, depending whether in the case that they have like a different membership schema and they have different prices for depending on whether you have some sort of membership. So that's a bit tricky. Yeah, so, so we, we, ha we haven't uh, um, allowed for that in this version of the spec. Right? Okay, cool. We know that that's, that's a future requirement, but I think it fits in because um, at the point where you provide, um, uh, you're submitting an order quote for a known user, uh, you may also have additional information membership numbers or something that you've already certified and that the, pr the pricing, the quote can also be updated based on that. Um, it's also a reason for maybe having a, um, the separate availability check that gives you a, a updated set of offers for members and non-members. That's, that's one of the things that we've been struggling so far at my local page. So when we, when we are sending, submitting a booking to a system, we have all we, we have to do that on behalf of a member ID or a user ID or, or whatever. So ideally, that sh it'd be great if we could build the system in the way that this information is sent to the uh, provider transparently. That means that they, they can figure out what's a member ID for that user without we having to pass that information along. So I think so for so for version one, I think we'll be we'll be saying that these would be required fields. Um, but there could be additional optional fields, and if a broker and a provider want to, you know, adjust pricing based on other data that's provided by the user, then that's that's fine. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't necessarily dig into the detail of that in version one. Okay, cool, fair enough. I'm sorry, is the sorry, it's Tom. Uh, is the expectation there that this customer is being created as a new record and database, uh, taken as an anonymous record uh, with some additional information? or matching to an existing record if it happens to be so? I think the, the legend, uh, uh, the legend um, customer meeting on this yesterday actually, uh, all the customers had different like, team of customers that I put in from the deep sphere. Um, so, uh, so basically um, the uh, answer is you can link it to existing records if you want to. The problem is in most systems, emails are by family members, which makes it difficult to definitively link this particular email address to that particular record. Um, I know in Vastek and uh, Legend, certainly that's the case um, on multiple email addresses in use, um, not, not being used as the primary key. And so because of that, uh, Legend are implementing this with the, uh, a separate third party table, if you like, of, of all the users that are being uh, come through the third party channels. But they are having unique um, entries per email address. So if you've got 500 apps, they would all use the same. Uh, as each other, um, because they would they would use that unique email address to uh, record that. 
Um, but there was also discussion in the room about whether you would want to use some heuristics to match to existing members if you want to pick one of the email addresses from the family and link it to that or something. Um, but the conclusion was at this point, because it's obviously still version one, maybe just have a separate table of third parties and uh, and then if, if we need to do some heuristic matching later, then that data is available to do that. Um, just as a thought on GDPR, if you've got you, if you're receiving a request like this, there's no way you could heuristically match to unassociated records unless the broker is definitely associating the account. Because otherwise, if, if Legend were to associate two records without the customer's consent, that's breach of GDPR, I think. So that's just one thing to be aware of on the on the provider side. Yeah, I think would, wouldn't you cover that in the in a legal sort of notice when they start the process, though, like even under privacy uh, conditions on your website? So under the condition that perhaps I have a mobile number and then a year later somebody else has that mobile number because I've stopped using it and it's reassigned, um, associating those two accounts via the mobile number isn't necessarily a guaranteed method. And so you could then potentially um, connect two accounts that aren't even associated. So it's, it, that kind of thing is actually quite uh, dangerous to do, especially just for account, uh, like for the validity of your data. But even if two... Um, bookings were made by two people that were using the same email address. It doesn't matter if they share an email address. If they're two different people, then they'd have to give direct consent that the accounts can be linked. Um, otherwise, you're making an assumption on their behalf and then potentially sharing information about what the separate individuals are doing. Um, so it's just just something to be aware of because we're passing information between bodies and brokering data. Um, if the controller isn't uh, the the, pr uh, the provider but is the broker, then the broker wouldn't necessarily want that information to be linked. So, uh, Nick, you seem to be muted again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Um, sorry, the, yes, it's from a from a um, the legends point of view. It was around heuristics for the reporting perspective. So just within the the data they had for the, for them to look at how many customers they have and and all the all the kind of uh, reports they might want to run about people coming into the centres. The heuristics on that side rather than for looking at procedure image, but it totally makes sense what you're saying. Um, we should definitely get on board. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, uh, that bears a bit more thinking, a bit more discussion. I think. Um, some, some points there. Um, Sorry, can I just, uh, I, I think someone said just a little while ago that um, the ability to provide different prices to different people or different people with met different memberships was not going to be in the first part of this. Is that correct? Yeah. Because we, we would definitely need that. Um, we, we, you know, if, if, a, if a customer has a specific, if a member has a specific men, uh, membership, then they're going to get a different price from somebody who's got a different membership. So I think the current thinking in terms of the way that would be handled um, was that, um, that all customers are assumed to be non-members and get the pricing off the, off the shelf as if they just walked in, and even if they had an existing membership already. Um, so that because if they're coming to a, a channel such as my local pitch or such as or one of these many apps that are available, they would be um, coming through a third party channel, not expecting their membership um, prices to be um, quoted. Whereas if they'd come through the provider's own website, um, then it would be a different story because they would expect member prices. What do you think about that? Um... Well, at the moment, the API that we, we've created, we're, we're using that API ourselves. So any functionality that the, the customer's website requires needs to be in the API as far as we're concerned. Okay, interesting. That sounds like that, that's not the same implementation question is in there. So we could, we could put, if you, if you wanted to, we could put, um, enough information here to match them against a member, but as to Kent, Kent's point, if we do that consumer side matching, that requires another flow of, of, of associating accounts and user permissions. So um, it might be something that we need, should pick up in the next conversation, I wonder. Um, yeah, I'd be really keen to pick that up. I was going to say to, to Kent here, if he's on the Slack channel, if we could pick this up on Slack channel at some point as well. I've got a few queries around that. Yeah, sure, more than happy to. Cool, great, thank you. Okay, well, let's, let's continue that discussion offline. I think that that mechanism can still layer on top of the basic workflow that we're providing here. 
um, just might require a bit more information being passed at a couple of points. Um, so I am going to wind up the call now. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, giving up the time again this afternoon. Uh, as always, it's a really useful way to give some uh, feedback. Um, it's really val valuable advice. So we've got some good takeaways for the next steps. Nick's very easy to jump in at the final bit. Nick? Uh, if anyone has any tax information or knowledge, uh, we would love you to um, just message us in advance of the next call because we've got the next call is about tax. Hopefully you'll still turn up uh, and it's going to be about VAT and how we do VAT and receipts and all that stuff. Uh, Jamie has very kindly offered to look out for you for our conversation. You know, work, um, but we're very keen to get as many uh, inputs into that as possible to make sure that we build this in the right way. So uh, yes, please do that. Uh, if you have tax advice or knowledge, do that call. Sorry. Okay. Exciting trailer for next time. Yes, right. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Uh, see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Thanks, guys.